Um, thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about coal mining in America. It really was a culture unto itself. And many, many Rusins, no matter where they are today, and many, many Slovaks, and many, many Poles, and many, many Lithuanians, and Italians, many um, people all over this country can trace their roots to some ancestor who came to work coal mines in the United States during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and in fact, um, I know that often whenever um, I'm talking to people and they're asking me genealogic, genealogical questions, they will come up with, um, they'll say, you know, my grandparents came to um, Simpson, Pennsylvania or German, Pennsylvania, oh and I'll say to them, I know exactly where that is. And they would say to me, how do, can you know where those tiny little coal mining towns are? And I said, because if you do this work long enough, gene, especially genealogical work in East European communities, um, there are so many people whose roots come out of these little small towns. Um, and these people are scattered, of course, across the nation and around the world today. But they're the birthplace of their Americanism, if you will, were little coal mining towns in, um, in both the hard and soft coal regions, as well as um, other coal mining areas in the Appalachians, especially, and even out west. Um, uh, my personal roots are not, or I should say, are, are only partially in coal mining. My, as you can tell from my last name, my father's family oh, is Italian. And my great grandfather came to work coal mines in Western Pennsylvania. But his sons, like many others in Western Pennsylvania, as soon as they had the opportunity to work elsewhere rather than in the coal mines, um, they seized that opportunity. And so some of them um, worked the steel mills of Western Pennsylvania, and some of them worked the chemical factories of North Central New Jersey. Um, and there was a, a continual flux of when people could get out of the coal mines, if they had the opportunity oh. to do something else, they did. Um, but coal mining was, and let me, uh, it's not working. coal mining was something that was absolutely integral to the development of the United States That's during the Industrial Revolution. Um, here you can see a group of men and boys at the entrance of the coal mine in Eastern I'm sorry, can you remind people to mute their microphones? You're hearing everything but you. Yes, hey, just to uh, remind Please, everyone, please mute your uh, your microphones, please, so we can hear the presenter. Uh, thank you for your cooperation. Okay. Um, here's a, a, a typical picture of coal miners at the turn of the century, men and boys working in the coal mines. This is at the entrance to the mine. And a lot of the artwork, especially, you're going to see comes from coal mines of eastern Pennsylvania. Um, and that's because that really kind of was the birth of coal in the United States. States and really the first place that immigrants came to work coal mines. Now, unlike what you perhaps were taught growing up, our ancestors, those who came to many, many um, European immigrants, and especially from Southern and Eastern Europe and Austria, Hungary in particular, didn't wake up one day and say, I think I'll go to America for more opportunity. Um, instead, whenever the industrial revolution took root, starting in the, especially in the 1870s in the United States, what happened was, so um, these companies had to go elsewhere for employees, and what they did was actually send recruiters to other parts of the world to bring back young men to work in these, these factories and coal mines and what have you. So a very large number of coal miners um, were actually recruited by the coal mines and the representative would be sent from the coal mine um, and he would go to a particular village in a particular area and talk to young men, mostly 18 to 25 years old. So those who were in good physical condition could do hard labor and tell them that he could bring them to America and that they would make X number of dollars a week and that they would make far more money that they could make than they could make staying in Europe. And, um, and that they didn't even have to have money to go because the coal mine would pay their way to the United States. And then once they got there then the, they, and went to work for the coal mine, they would take a little bit out of their pay every week to pay for their transportation. Uh, um, so most people didn't choose to become coal miners. They were recruited to become coal miners. And the other part of that, which is critical, is that when these young men were making the decision to come to the United States, um, they weren't making a decision to come and stay. 
Um, this was an economic, short-term economic decision. So the vast majority of young people who came to the United States came to work the coal mines or whatever industry to make money to go back to buy their own property to be property to be independent of their landlords. And so there was no long-term plan to stay. And, and many families, when they do the research on their relatives, they find that their um, ancestors ran back and forth across the Atlantic like you and I go to the grocery store. I and mean, for people who were sometimes in very isolated scenarios, these young people were fearless and had no trouble going back and forth. And often you'll see in small towns when you go back and visit some of these European communities, there'll be something in that village donated, quite often a village cross, donated by young men in America who were natives of that particular village. So these folks were recruited, and as such, the concept of um, chain migration developed as well. And what this means is that a group of young men, let's say 20 would be recruited from a village and brought to a particular settlement where there was a coal mine, they would start working and then as jobs came available, more jobs came available, they would write to other friends and brothers and cousins in that village and say, come on over. So what you end up have happening in many coal towns, especially because they're smaller than industrial towns like factory towns or steel towns, is that you have a very large portion of um, people in that, in that particular coal community coming from the same village in Europe. And so often you can um, you can go to a little coal mining town and it has Croatians, Slovaks, and Italians, and all the Italians are from one or two villages, all the Croatians are from one village, and all the Slovaks are from two villages. Um, so And there's so obviously therefore a lot of connectivity between them as well. But what prompted this was the Industrial Revolution, as we started to say, and coal played a particular role because Coal is a part of what fueled everything. It was really hard on a, a large scale level for factories to be fueled without something that was going to be inexpensive, and but there was plenty of. Um, and the other thing too was that coal allowed the system of heating in homes in the United States and elsewhere to be converted to a much more efficient and warmer style of heat. So now a lot of homes no longer had to ha burn wood to heat themselves. Wood burns nice and hot, but it burns very quickly and you have to have a lot of it. Um, now you could use coal, which coal burns um, slowly and, and very hot. Um, and so a little bit of coal goes a long way. Uh, and so there were two economic factors here then was, how do we get enough coal out of the ground, both to heat homes and run factories? Um, and so with that discovery of fossil fuels on a grand scale, um, th this issue of heating and factory development is what caused there to be a lot of need for people to work coal mines because they really needed to be cranking this coal out at incredible rates. And here's a, an image of a particular coal town, um, and these are anthracite fields in Pennsylvania. Um, the big building is called the Coal Breaker, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but this is um, for these are for steel. So these are generally not always, but generally steel towns in western Pennsylvania. <coughs> the, pound, the towns in eastern Pennsylvania were primarily for heating purposes. Um, but you can see the coal breaker and the coal mine here. If you look off in the distance, what you see is the community, the um, the uh, the little uh, coal patch as they call them with several houses, um, usually one or two churches, and you can see it was pretty much within walking distance of the coal mine. Now, the role that coal played in industry, and particularly in the development of the steel industry, was significant. Um, the, just the process of turning iron ore into steel required heat that could only be produced by burning co a coke. And coke is not coal, it's coal that's been heated to a very high temperature. Um, and so what has to happen then is you need all this coal for the steel mills, but before it goes into the steel mills, then it has to go into coke ovens. Um, and this way, um, excuse me one minute while I grab my battery here. Thank you for your 
indulgence. My computer just sent a message, hook the battery in. So, um, so it close to steel mills, <coughs> between where the coal patches were and the steel mills needed to be communities where there were Coke ovens. And Coke ovens were these massive, massive ovens, just uh, in rows and rows and rows, brick ovens with great big holes in them and a, like a, a small chimney on the top that would let the heat out. And the coal would be shoveled by men into these Coke ovens and converted to Coke and then put in rail cars and shipped into steel mills. Now, coal came in two forms, um, bituminous and anthracite. Um, and uh, these two, as I talked about earlier, played different roles in the development of um, the, in the industrial development. Um, one, one bituminous coal is, um, is a, was used primarily for industry, and it's called soft coal. It was primarily mined in western Pennsylvania, eastern Ohio, West Virginia, um, and that's would therefore and therefore that's a part of why a lot of steel mills were located there because it was a quick source for them. Hard coal or anthracite coal um, was born out of the eastern Pennsylvania and especially the northeastern territories around Wilkesbury and Scranton and coming down the Panther River Valley. Um, so. Um, the, you had two types of coal mined for two different purposes. And um, I can tell you that within the, the um, and I'm sure in many East European communities, it's this way, but within the Rusin community, whenever, <coughs> excuse me, we find out someone is a coal miner or comes from coal, our first question is, oh, are you hard coal or soft coal? Um, and everybody who works in the coal industry knows that and, and knows what that means. So if you're soft coal, you mine bituminous coal. If you're hard coal and you mine anthracite coal. And I talked about the coal ovens. Here's an opportunity for you to see what they look like. These are the ones in Connellsville, Pennsylvania, which is the far southwest corner of the state. And if you look up, up, up at the back of the picture, you can see pretty clearly this series of hole, like brick walls with holes in them. And that's the front to the oven. And the coal, which as you can see is over here on the side, there's a guy with a uh, wheelbarrow, the coal on that side is taken in and shoved into the ovens to make coke. And then the white plumes you see coming out of the top is the smoke coming out of each one of these. Um, I was just very recently in a small town in um, Ohio I had never heard of before and it called Letonia. Um, and when I went there, my friend took me to show me that they now have a like a community park that actually is the old coke ovens. And it fascinated me that you could walk up and down those rows that you see those men in there and that there were just 40, 50, 60 of these ovens going for a great big long stretch and that the railroad actually used to come up to those particular ovens so that they could put them in the, in the rail cars and be able to send them to steel. Now, as we say, so now that your test at the end is you're gonna, I'm going to ask you what's hard coal and what's soft coal, so don't forget that. Okay. Let's talk about demographics. I've outlined a little bit of the industry and how people got here, but who came um, and how did they came and why did the coal mines um, bring who they brought? Well, there was, as I said, this enormous need for labor and, um, and this is pre-unionization, so you could pretty much pay these people whatever you wanted and work them however much you wanted. So it was a heavily labor-intensive industry. The very first coal miners to come to the United States were a mixture of those recruited and then very quickly after that, some who came voluntarily. And they were mostly from the British Isles. So they were Welsh, English, and Irish, and especially the Welsh and the English who had a heritage of coal mining. They were coal miners in their own country. And so they had experience and that was helpful for the new coal industry in the United States. But after a while, even they were not enough to populate the coal mines. And so the recruiters went to Southern and Eastern Europe. Um, and um, in the Southern Europe, a lot of Italians from the very poor Southern portion of Italy. Um, and in the East um, from many um, nations, Croatians and Serbians and Slovenians, um, at least in Western Pennsylvania, a very, very high percentage of coal miners are Slovenians, um, so much so that there are, whole, there are coal mining towns here that the entire population is Slovenian or of Slovenian heritage. 
Um, but then they really concentrated very heavily on Austria-Hungary. Um, this was a multinational state at the time. Um, there was a lot of poverty. Um, Europe was going in the 1870s through an, a depression, so there was a lot of unemployment at that stage of the game. Um, and things were, were very shaky in Eastern Europe. And plus, Austria, when I say multinational, I mean within, I know I'm going to miss somebody, but within Austria-Hungary lived the Austro-Germans, of course, and the Hungarians, but then the Slovenians, the Croatians, the Serbs, the Bosnians, the Poles, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Rusyns, the, the, East, the West Ukrainians, the Romanians, the Jews, the Gypsies, and German immigrants. So an enormous ethnic mix within one state for you to be able to go and, and draw people from. And they were able very, very successfully to be able to recruit these poor men, again, based on what I told you, that they, you know, they promised that they were going to have decent jobs with good wages. And the reality was it was true. Yes, they had to work very long hours in very dangerous conditions, but the reality is for the times, they were making far better money than they could in Europe, and obviously va the vast majority of them were unemployed too. Um, the, one of the other reasons that young men came from, especially Austria-Hungary, um, to the coal mines was because of conscription. Um, Austria-Hungary had tightened its conscription laws. Every young man had to serve some period of time in the armed forces. And while this isn't an uncommon thing, even today in some states, it was very difficult especially for non-Germans and non-Hungarians in, um, in the military service. So the Slavs in particular, um, who were in the Austro-Hungarian army, were really treated, I can't tell you they were treated like second-class citizens, they were treated like slaves. Their existence was so poor, their, uh, their, their um, commanding officer could literally do anything he wanted to do with them at any moment in time. Um, people who were in the armed forces of Slavic background were beaten regularly and taken advantage of. It was such a horrible existence that um, amongst the Carpathians and I suspect other Slavs, the number one cause of death in the Austro-Hungarian army was suicide. Um, that's how hard it was for them. So when you learn, you were coming up on the age of conscription, you would pretty much do anything you could to get out of having to do that. And so these young men would gladly jump on a boat and go work a coal mine to escape this. So much so that um, when some people do genealogical research on their grandfathers or great grandfathers, they find they have a problem because they can't find them anywhere. They can't find his name on a ship's manifest or anything in Ellis Island. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's because by the time we get to the late 1800s, the 1890s especially, so many, so many young men were leaving Austria-Hungary and especially the Hungarian portion of the empire that the local Hungarian governments put restrictions on the number of men who could leave the country. Um, and see, if you got conscripted, that was absolute no-no. There's no way you could leave. You had to serve, I think it was active service of six years or eight years, and then you had to be in reserve for a 20 year period. So you were committed, you couldn't even leave your village once you were conscripted into the military. So how do young men get out once the government says no more young men can leave and go to America or Canada or anywhere? Well, here's what they do. Um, they get some brother or cousin or whatever's name and they go to immigrate and they use that name and the government can look at the records and see that that person had already immigrated to the United States, so he could go. He was just going back, but he wasn't. He was using his brother's a new guy using his brother's name to go. And so oftentimes when um, people are doing um, genealogy research in Austria-Hungary, um, they have to re really kind of do additional research. There's a reason you can't find your grandfather on the ship's manifest on the day and the, on the boat and the date he came. It's because he came under an assumed name. Uh, and this is not entirely um, distinct to Austria-Hungary, but very, very, very common amongst Austro-Hungarian immigrants. Let's talk a little bit more about demographics. So these young men come here, and you notice I keep talking about young men, because since uh, these immigrants were coming to make money and go back to Europe, they weren't bringing, these were not married men bringing wives and children. So the vast majority of these are young single men 
who are coming basically to work, migrant workers, if you will, except they're crossing an ocean. Um, the setting up of the communities and running of the mines was a little difficult because these people were culturally disconnected. This is the first time in an American context, and actually for most of these people, that you have to work a lot every day alongside of men who you can't communicate with. You know, that um, Croatians and Hungarians and Italians and Slovenians are all working in the same coal mine, or Slovaks and Ukrainians and Romanians are all working in the same coal mine. And so this was a the distinct challenge for um, mine supervisors to be able to manage these men until they learned at least rudimentary English. <coughs> the other problem was very quickly, there was antagonisms between men in the coal mine because um, unlike today where you get paid a particular wage by what your particular job was, particular job is, at that time people were paid by the value they were to the coal process and the coal company, which was virtually by ethnicity. So if those who were came from the British Isles, like um, the English, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, because they could speak English, they were paid at a higher rate than the non-English speakers. Um, and so you keep going down and then come eventually, you know, um, other Western Europeans, um, Germans and Austrians, then you get down to Italians, um, and then surprisingly you get to African Americans who were recruited, um, unemployed African Americans or sharecroppers to come from the South who were recruited occasionally to work in coal mines. This didn't happen a lot, but then African Americans and then below, and then after African Americans, the bottom of the barrel were Slavs, um, who were uh, the basic laborers. And of course, a uh, part of why African Americans were of more value than the Slavs was because they could speak English as well. So that, that helped them a little bit. But so if you're of any kind of Slavic background, know that you can that you were your ancestors were paid the least that anybody could be paid in a coal mine. And if any of you ever has the opportunity to visit Johnstown, Pennsylvania, um, there's an immigration history museum there in the Cambria city section of the city and there's a section on coal mining where they actually list on the wall in the Johnstown area coal mines what ethnic group got paid by and where they fell in the pecking order um, so you can see it with your own eyes um, so roles in the mine therefore those of English Irish Scotch extraction had a much better chance and often pretty rapidly became supervisors in the mine again because they could speak English um, those others, the, the Southern and Eastern Europeans basically did all the hard labor. Um, who worked? Well, often I keep talking about these young men, but in addition to men, boys worked in the coal mines as well. This is before child labor laws and, um, and families needed income however they could get it. And so young boys, some as young as eight years of age, would go to work in the coal mine. Most didn't work in the mine itself. Most worked on coal breakers. And well, coal breakers is a section right outside the mine that when they bring the coal out, you have to sit, they would sit there and hand and hand um, separate the coal from things like slate. So that, that taking the garbage out and putting the coal in one particular section. Uh, and so you'll often hear about, and those of you who have coal heritage would have heard about breaker boys who worked there. But sometimes, and sometimes in a coal mine setting, boys worked in very dangerous settings like if a coal vein which is when you go in the mine the section is full of coal that you're going to dig out sometimes the the ceiling is low and if it was the vein was too low for them to be able to get the coal for men to be able to get the coal out of they would send boys in with sacks who would then have to load the sacks sometimes on their bellies and, and bring the coal back out um, so they were coal mines were a great example of the need for child labor laws Here's a typical coal mine at the turn of the century. Um, so this one is a, like a really nice one because yeah, as you can see, men could stand up in it. Oftentimes you can see the shiny back wall, that's coal. So you can see that they're digging into the wall. They would use lumber like you see here on the left that um, to hold up the ceilings. And you know sometimes ceilings gave way and people were crushed and you know, uh, mine accidents were an everyday occurrence all over the United States at the time of immigration. 
Um, but you know, this is nice because they can stand up. A lot of veins were no higher than three to four feet high. So some men went in there and worked 12, 16 hour days hunched over the entire time. Here's, here's breaker boys. Here they are, um, they're separating slate from coal in the anthracite mine. So this is in Eastern Pennsylvania. You can see the supervisor at the top of the stairs and you can see um, the boys, the, the, the um, coal comes down and kind of in between their feet and then they take the pieces and separate them. Okay, we already talked about recruited in Europe and some of these people had experience because I talked about the Welsh and the English but also um, some of the other groups that had experience who came once they found this out were Slovaks and Poles um, because both of these communities had existing mines and some of them even coal mines. And so um, some of these communities, um, if you're descended from some of these people, they would have been ancestors who actually worked in mines in um, Northeastern Hungary, which was where the Slovaks lived, what is now Slovakia, or the Galician portion of um, of Austria-Hungary, which, which were ethnically Poles and today is in Poland. Um, why did they come? I already kind of went through that with you. We have, they came for multiple reasons. The most, the most serious one was economic. They were coming to be able to make more money and live a better life than they could in Europe, with, but with no intention of staying. Um, the only reason, in fact, you and I are having this discussion, if you are descended from any of these immigrants today, here in the United States is because um, at the, at the, by the time we get to 1920, there are so, immigrants are coming in such whopping numbers from other countries that the um, quote Americans were concerned that um, they were gonna be outnumbered in their own country. Um, and so the United States Congress passed laws in 1922 and then later in 1924 called um, called um, the immigration laws that in essence restricted um, the number of immigrants who could come into the United States. But interestingly enough, because this is the, the, the time when there was a lot of discussion which led up to Nazi Germany and, um, and to a lot of other issues, there was a lot of scientific discussion about the, um, the abilities of each race and each race was each ethnicity. And, um, and so some were perceived to be able to do things that others could not. Um, and so America had this thing where they wanted, if they were gonna let people into the country, they at least wanted to let people in who were like them. And they were all descended from um, people of the British Isles and mostly Germany. And so if you were from um, Great Britain or you were from anywhere in Northwestern Europe, the Scandinavian lands, Germany, um, France, etc. you had very little restrictions in terms of the numbers of you that could come. But if you were from Southern and Eastern Europe, um, and I'm making these numbers up, but I'm just giving as an example. So now each year now only 5,000 Italians, only 2,000 Slovaks, only 3,000 Serbians. So it became very restrictive. And what happened was for our people, you heard me talk about for East Europeans and Southern Europeans especially, um, when they were running back and forth, um, taking money back, getting married, starting families. So, you know, now these guys who in 1902 were 18, well, you know, now they're, um, they're 22 years old and they've now brought their wife and they've brought their kids, but now they're concerned. What happens if they leave and go home to Europe and Europe should explode again like it did in World War I and they wanted to come back into the US and they couldn't get in because of the immigration laws? Um, that really concerned them. And so it's at that moment that most Southern and Eastern European immigrants made the decision that they were gonna stay in the United States. And I tell people who are doing their genealogical research, go back and look at your um, ancestors' naturalization records, because I'm going to guarantee that 85% of them became American citizens sometimes somewhere between 1922 and 1929. Uh, so that's when we made the decision for uh, particularly people of Southern and Eastern Europe to be able to stay here in, in the United States. One other significant component of a coal town for, and for families for economics was that everybody in the family worked. 
So the father and the sons went into the mines. While they did that, generally what the mothers did was to take in boarders. And what this meant was that once families were here and they had a, a larger house to live in, they would set up a particular sec section, usually the second floor of the house, with almost wall-to-wall -wall beds. And these young men coming who had no mothers here and no wives, and no one to take care of them, no one to cook for them and sew for them, they would pay the woman of the house a certain fee, like a rental fee, to be able to live in the home. And she would feed, make cook their three meals, and she would, you know, do their sewing and stitching. She would wash their clothing. And, um, and it was actually, it was a really a great economic model, though an awful lot of work for women, um, because since coal mines work three shifts, they could sleep three shifts worth of men in those beds. So when you came home from the mine and went to sleep in your bed and you got up at four o'clock because the next guy's coming home and he's gonna sleep in that bed. And then he gets up at midnight and the next guy's gonna come home and sleep in that bed. And then you're gonna come back at eight o'clock in the morning again and sleep in your bed. So three guys to a bed rotating and um, and you would pay the, the um, woman of the household to in essence take care of you um, since you had no women of your own. And the daughters of those families, it was very interesting. Um, you know, in every coal patch, there's all these poor people working, but there's, as you heard me talk about, supervisory people and, and owners and, um, and people who have, are in management in the coal industry. Um, and they live in these beautiful, beautiful mansions that are built. And if you ever go to these, any of these coal patches anywhere, you can always see these homes in a, a particular area of town, not where the immigrants live. Um, and they were well-to-do, but, you know, it's still the early 1900s. There's no concept of birth control. These people have money, but they also have big families. And so quite often what happened was the daughters of the immigrants um, would go into the homes of the well-to-do to work as house servants. And so they would um, sometimes be there taking care of children like nannies. Sometimes they are cooks within the household. Sometimes there are people that just do the cleaning and the laundry for, let's say, here's a classic upper middle class family in a coal patch. So you can see by their clothing that they're doing very well, um, but they still got seven kids. Um, so those, those people, have, those kids have to be taken care of. And that became the economic contribution that daughters in the household could make. So you had fathers and sons in the mines mothers taking care of boarders and daughters going out as house servants. Um, the coal patch was different than any other economic model in the United States. I call it industrial socialism. Um, and I always kind of laugh that as much as American industry was against socialism, the greatest socialist experiment in American history was the coal patch done by the companies themselves. <coughs> When you lived in, and worked in a coal patch, your life was pr pretty much run by and managed by and almost owned by the coal company. And how does that happen? Well, in the first place, um, when they brought immigrants to these coal mines and they open these, they find these coal patches and they open them up. The first thing they do is they very quickly put up inexpensive row houses called company houses. And the company owns them. They look almost, all of them look just like the one next to them and you rent them from the coal company you work for. And so they can take money out of your pay each week to be able to pay for your rent. Um, now this becomes a problem in unionization because when met, people started to unionize, um, you know, if you were active in the union and the coal mine company found this out, they could at a moment's notice as your landlord evict you. And you could go to work in the morning, and by that night, you and your kids and your wife and your furniture's out on the street corner. So the company, the house you lived in was owned by the coal company. Likewise, coal patches didn't have, because they were generally small, they didn't have like you would call a business district that had all kinds of fruit stores and furniture stores and grocery stores until much later in their existence. In the early days, there was a company store that was like a kind of a general merchandise, merchandise thing. You could buy everything from your food stuff, canned goods, et cetera, to material, um, to medicines, all of that kind of stuff in the company store. And how did you pay for it? 
Well, when you got paid on payday, you didn't get paid in dollars. You got paid in the company's own monetary system, which was called script. And so you got X amount of company script on payday. And therefore, um, it would be very, very hard for you to even go to another town with a downtown business district to shop because you don't have dollars. You have money that's only acceptable in the company store. And so now you buy everything from the business. You're, you're now your boss owns where you sleep and owns all the food and, and clothing you buy. And you have to use his monetary system to do it. Now, now there you obviously as um, contemporary Americans, when you talk about the pros and cons, the cons was that you didn't have any independence whatsoever, that the, co the coal company virtually owned you economically. Um, but the pros were, and you'd think that immigrants would be horrified by this system, and they weren't, because what they liked was the stability, that they knew that there was always going to be goods at their fingertips, um, that they knew that they were going to have a roof over their head. Some of these people coming from such tenuous circumstances in Europe, that they liked the stability that, um, that a, a company-owned system brought them. And here's an example of row houses. If you've never been in one of these coal towns, this is exactly what they look like. They're on both sides of the street. There's the middle of the, the middle of the street, and those are the times a dirt road. And um, and generally they were built two story. And as you as you heard me talk about, they weren't built for families. They were built originally for just like a like a hostel or a, or a dormitory for all these young men. Here's more um, in a Pennsylvania coal town. Here's some more. These are nicer ones and they're not quite as close to one another. Um, and then, so you can see the houses and they are just, they literally just took the same footprint and duplicated it over and over and over again. And then you can see the coal mine right in the back on the right hand side. Okay. Unionization, one of the biggest hot spots of the creation of unions in the United States was the coal patches. And as you can imagine, once, and, and who started this, who were those initial, those who, uh, of those who were unhappy were the immigrants from the British Isles. So you've heard of things like the Molly Maguires in, in the Scranton area in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, these were, these folks from the British Isles were the beginning, beginners of unionization and creating unions. And one of the things that people don't really realize, you see here, I have the seed of socialism. Um, you know, when we learn about unions in America, as you and I, as young children, no one ever talks about that really what the unionization movement was, was spawned by socialism. Um, and that the AFL-CIO was but William Z. Foster was a socialist. And that the, the attempts to organize the workforce in America was patterned after um, the the Marxist system that this new new Soviet Union had was just setting up. So American business was absolutely terrified of the union move, unionization movement for fear that what it was going to do was turn America into a socialist nation. Um, so these unions, their birthplace for coal miners was in eastern Pennsylvania, um, and they really started to take off. There were horrible battles between unions and the company. There were often battles between groups because um, one of the things that the coal companies would use against the miners, two tools they used, and quite honestly, steel companies used this more than coal companies did because they were bigger and had much more, much more um, larger workforces. One thing was that if the, when the British Islanders went on strike, then they would send recruiters to Eastern Europe to bring East, Southern and East European men to work, in essence, as scabs to replace them. And so there was hard feelings between, for instance, the Irish and the Slavs in, in Eastern Pennsylvania because the Slavs were brought to replace them and take their jobs. Once the Slavs learned about unionization and began to learn English and began to join the unionization movement, then what these companies would do is they would bring poor black sharecroppers from the south so that when the Slavs and the, and the British Islanders were on strike now, the blacks could work. Um, and this, needless to say, creates um, in the north some of the racial issues we still deal with today in terms of the antagonisms between whites and blacks, because blacks were brought to, in essence, take their jobs. 
But in addition to this, one of the things that coal companies and steel companies learned pretty readily and that they liked was this multilingual thing was a double-edged sword. At first, they didn't, they, it made them crazy that, you know, all these people don't speak the same language. One of the other things, however, was that if you brought men from different areas of the world who couldn't speak to one another, well, guess what? They also can't talk to one another to unionize. And so it, this contributed to the multi-ethnic nature of coal companies and more so steel towns, but coal companies as well, where you would at least go to three or four different ethnic groups to attract those people so that it wasn't as easy for them to unionize. Now, here's, um, I, I always find this picture to be really poignant. You know, when you were on strike as a union, you really had a problem because you weren't getting paid. And not only were you not getting paid, but you also you can't, you also couldn't go to the company store to buy things because you weren't getting any script to buy things with. Um, and you couldn't even, uh, in fact, access coal. So these are two um, women who are in a coal dump. This is where the scrap goes from the coal. And they're going through there during a coal strike, looking for, in those buckets, small pieces of coal that they could take home, that they can collect enough to be able to heat their homes. Oop, excuse me. So coal country, let's talk about how it is a culture unto itself. What did these coal patches become? The coal patch was isolated. Um, unlike steel mills and factories, which are built next to one another, going up and down a coast or up and down a river, so one blends into another, coal patches are pretty much little isolated settings. They cluster around the entry to the mine, and then you go a couple more miles, and then there's another one, and a couple more miles, and there's another one. So these communities were pretty isolated, not unlike the villages these people left in the homeland. So especially those who came from mountainous areas, these people were already living in little villages in the mountains that were, you know, two or three miles from the next village, et cetera. So they became very isolated, and as such, that affected their mindset as well. There are very few groups in one town, as you heard me say, three or four ethnic groups maybe, um, and so it was easy also because they were isolated and they were with a lot of their own people to maintain their native culture. So what you saw in these coal towns was that Slovak culture in, in these coal towns was lived out just like they lived it in Slovakia. You know, all the customs were preserved, the music was preserved, the dancing, the foods, um, the practices, the folk medicine, all of this was preserved very well within these communities because they were so isolated. Now, that might be a positive. One of the negatives, however, was that because these people were isolated from the rest of America, from large communities, from people with educations, is that their mindset always it remained narrow, that their world was very small, and so their mindset was very small as well. Now, new thinking, of course, does occur amongst these people. It's not like they were so isolated that nothing new ever came, because one thing you do have to remember is different, different Different, different, excuse me, is that while they were isolated, they were still in America where things were different from the old country. You know, they're buying their food differently, even if it is a script. And they're interacting Slovaks to Italians, which would have never happened in the old country within their community. And so they do learn things, and especially with unionization, because union organizers always came from outside the community and came in to tell you what was going on and why you want better conditions and how people were living better in other places. So with this idea and the access to um, American media that once you could read English, you could buy an American newspaper and know what was going on, um, and then eventually American radio did at least expand them. So they learned new concepts that they never had in Europe. Um, they learned the concept of self-determination that they had some control over making the decisions in their life. They can decide, do they want to live in this coal patch or not? Or do they want to move somewhere else? And one of the things people are often um, find very difficult when they're researching their ancestors is that, you know, coal, depending on how the mine was doing, you know, you could exhaust the amount of coal in a small town and that was it, you know, and then everybody picks up and moves to some other coal patch. 
um, to be able to work there. So it was, it, you know, you could work, a coal mine could last you for 50 years, but then again, a coal mine could last you for 15. It just depends what you find when you get underneath the ground. Um, and so these people did go sometimes move from coal patch to coal patch, or sometimes in the unionization effort, if a company owned multiple coal mines, the one that's on strike, they shut it down. And so people had to economically go find something else. But so they had more control, even though all, with everything they had, they could self-determine. You know, in Europe, you heard me talk about like Austro-Hungarian cons conscription. You know, when you were conscripted, then you were on um, reserve, you couldn't move from that village. Uh, legally, you could not move from your village to somewhere else um, because the government said, I have to know where you are. Um, and then with uh, not only with self-determination, but with that came this idea of economic independence. Um, and these young guys that were coming, this, this was kind of already planted there. They liked the idea that they could go to America and make money and they can leave anytime they want and go back. And that even though the salaries were abysmal, they were better than what they could do in Europe. And yes, they could go out and buy a, a nice pair of shoes every once in a while. Or yes, they could buy a suit. And in fact, I'm sure any of you who come from immigrant families and especially coal families, one of the most cherished things every one of those families has is grandma and grandpa, him in his suit and her dress, a photograph. Their first photograph in America taken to show everybody in Europe how prosperous they were. And in fact, some of them, I, my great grandfather's first photo has his, um, GCU button on his Greek Catholic Union button on his lapel to show that he's, you know, somebody he's in this thing. And it also he has in his pocket a newspaper, which shows the people in Europe that he can read American newspapers. Um, so look for those little clues when you go back and look at your family's pictures. But so these people did begin to think differently and it caused them to do to take control of a couple of things they would have never thought of doing in Europe. And the first and foremost is the birth of fraternals. Now, fraternal insurance organizations are organizations that get together, people pool their money, and then, um, and then, and in essence, buy little insurance policies. And then, if they need that money, it can be drawn drawn upon. And this happened out of necessity for immigrants, um, especially non English speaking immigrants, um, at that time, because American insurance companies would not insure them. They wouldn't take these immigrants and, and not, even if they wanted to give money, they wouldn't insure them. So these groups started little fraternal lodges or, or basically in a little town, there might be a group of, let's say, um, Slovak coal miners who get together and each, and they're all single guys. And now they have a problem. If one of them dies, how does he get buried? Who pays for it? Or even perhaps even more of an issue, if one of them gets sick, has to go to the hospital, who pays for it? So each of them contributes X amount of, of, of um, income each week to the, the common kitty, the fraternal. And then whenever someone needs is sick and needs to be paid for, there's money to pay for them. Or if somebody dies and needs to be buried, there's money to bury, pay for them. And these fraternals grew up, up as individual um, little lodges. And then over time, they began to pull together village town to town to village to village and become much larger fraternals. And a great example of this is the um, first one here, the Greek Catholic Union, which was founded in Wilkes-Barre, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania in 1892. So in the coal region, founded by Carpathian Russian immigrants. And it was a series of little lodges that pulled together. And actually the organization's name, once they pulled together, was the Greek Catholic Union of Rusin Brotherhoods. So that gives you some sense. Um, in 1896, a group broke off from the Greek Catholic Union in Wilkes-Barre um, because they were all from Galicia and they didn't believe their customs were the same as the Rusins from Hungary. And they founded the Ukrainian National Association. These two organizations, the Greek Catholic Union is still the largest Rusin fraternal in the United States. And the Ukrainian National Association is still the largest Ukrainian fraternal in the United States. Um, and then two others, which weren't founded in the coal country, the Slovak Catholic Sokol for Slovak Catholics, which was founded in North Jersey in, um, I believe in Passaic. Um, but 
but its reason they made this list is that it had a couple lodges in New Jersey that pulled together, but where its growth really took off was once it started to found lodges in eastern Pennsylvania and the coal towns, because there were so many Slovaks there. Likewise, the Polish National Alliance was founded in Philadelphia, but where its growth really occurred was once it started to organize poles in eastern Pennsylvania's coal patches. Now, in addition to taking control economically of themselves and, with, and creating these fraternal unions where they could buy insurance and be able to manage catastrophe, one of the other things that would have never occurred to people in Europe was that they took control of their religious destiny as well. And so they, these coal miners are responsible for new religious expression, which couldn't have possibly happened in the homeland. Um, the first I'm going to talk about are the Greek Catholics. Now, today in America, Greek Catholics are called Byzantine Catholics, um, and they were largely of Carpatha Rusin heritage. Um, but when they got here, they were different than every other immigrant group that had ever come here since, um, since the pilgrims in 1620. And that was they were the first ethnic group, religious group, to come without clergy. So, you know, the British came here 300 years earlier with the, the Anglican vicar, the Spanish came with the Catholic friar, but the Greek, these young independent Greek Catholic single boys came and they didn't, have, there was no Greek Catholic clergy with them. There was no Greek Catholic church structure in the United States. There was Roman Catholic church structure. There was Anglican church structure. There was none of that in the United States. And so these young guys come and at first, they start attending Roman Catholic parishes nearby, but then they want, their, they want their own churches. They have the money to do it with, and they go to local Protestant attorneys and say, how do we start a church in America? Who does this in Europe? Nobody, nobody would even think about doing this because also in Europe, people don't run the churches. You know, it was never a, it was never a congregational, we're gonna be in charge. And the Protestant attorneys say to them, well, you know, you get incorporated and then you have a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, um, you charge everybody a certain amount of money who are your members and they're the congregation and they make the decisions about what to do with the church. So these Greek Catholic churches are started like this, um, which is not the way Catholicism is, is organized. The property in the, in the Catholic Church belongs to the bishop, not to the people. And so here you have these, these by the way, these 18-year-old guys, their average education is third grade, okay? So you have uneducated, young single guys, um, and all of a sudden they own, they build and own these spectacular churches. And it made them think so independently that to this day, um, the, now, the Greek Catholic churches today are, in fact, owned by their local Greek Catholic bishop, but they had much consternation in two waves of people leaving the Greek Catholic church and joining or, or founding Orthodox dioceses so that they can maintain control of their properties and their decision making. Um, that's on the eastern right side. On the western right side, in Cold Territory, in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, um, comes the first challenge to Roman Catholicism in that when um, these immigrants get here and they, the, they want to found their own ethnic churches. The Poles want to go to a church where they can sing Polish hymns and the confession can be heard in Polish, um, except the local church is just an Irish church and it's, everything's in English. And so they want to found their own churches. And Roman Catholicism was very much against this. Um, and particularly because they are coming just on the heels of American acceptance of Catholicism as a legitimate American faith. So, you know, you may remember all of those stories about when the Irish first came to the United States, Irish need not apply. And so the Catholics in the United States at this point are largely Irish or German. Um, and they're in mixed parishes, usually between those two groups. And the Irish bishops who are largely, uh, the Catholic bishops are largely Irish, excuse me, um, are happy that finally people say, oh yeah, you can be a good Catholic and be an American citizen too. So they love the idea of Americanism and Americanization. And now here come these ethnic groups who want to have their own ethnic Roman Catholic churches. And so the, the Catholic Church in America really resisted this. But quite honestly, the numbers were so big that they couldn't stop it. And so when you go to these coal patches and other places where large ethnic groups settled, 
you find a Polish Roman Catholic Church, a Hungarian Roman Catholic Church, and uh, an Italian Roman Catholic Church. Amongst the Poles, though, there was a movement not unlike the Greek Catholics, where once they got here and had a taste of American freedom and a taste that they could control the parish, um, there was a movement in the Polish Roman Catholic Church for the congregations to, in essence, own the properties and run the parish as opposed to the priests. And uh, that caused them to make the decision to pull themselves out from under Rome, that they, the Pope would no longer be the head of their church, that they weren't Roman Catholics, they were national Catholics. They were committed to Polish nationalism. And they created the Polish National Catholic Church, which still exists and has about 26,000 members and 127 parishes, mostly in the United States. Um, and their cathedral is in, in Colpatch, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And they started this movement, which then caught, was caught on by other Roman Catholics from Eastern Europe who lived by them. And so out of their movement was born the Lithuanian National Catholic Church, which was always small and I don't think exists anymore. And then the Slovak National Catholic Church, which at one time had six or seven, I think it may have still have six or seven parishes left, but it's a very small church. The, um, the Slovak church, in fact, didn't become, it's always been under the auspices of the Polish church, but it got its own bishop in 1963, whereas the Lithuanians were already dependent in 1914. So what you see is that these concepts, I mean, just to think about this, young, educated people, young men from places where the church really was the church and called all the shots in their lives, and here in a very short period of 10 to 20 years of being here, both Eastern Rite Greek Catholics and Western Rite Roman Catholics feel bold enough to be able to take control of their churches and create their own faiths, if you will. Here, in fact, is St. Stanislaus Cathedral in Scranton, Pennsylvania. If you ever have the chance to go there, the Polish National Cathedral. So that gives you, I hopefully it gives you a picture of how different coal mining was and how different life as a coal miner was from all the other lives of American immigrants because they were they came and were so isolated in these communities and the economic structure that the coal companies set up was different than anywhere else in the United States so that the employee relied on the company for virtually everything so that that kind of influenced the mindset and influenced their capabilities but they still, as isolated as they were, America was not a vacuum. And as media expanded and as they became unionized and they were exposed to people outside of the coal patch, gave them the opportunity to begin to think like Americans with concepts like self-determination and controlling your own destiny. Um, so I thank you for your attention. I would be real happy to um, entertain any questions you may have. All right, thank you, John. Um, yes, uh, folks have left a lot of questions in the uh, in the uh, question box, so we'll start getting to them. So uh, the first question we have is, uh, did coal mines hire local villagers to assist them in the rec recruiting process? And the answer is yes. Um, and yes, they did. And they especially, sometimes what would happen is that, uh, you know, hire some young guy to come work here who, um, who just learned English very quickly, and then he became a part of the recruiting team. And so they would take him back to be able to talk to people of his same ethnic group um, to recruit them. But they also found that one of their greatest recruitment tools was, as they talked about chain migration, that once they got these young guys here and they were making money and doing well, they start sending letters to all their brothers and cousins and buddies saying, come on over, come on over. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, everyone, please keep your microphones on, on mute. Thank you. Um, so um, we have a question about uh, the how many hours a day did the coal miners work uh, typically, and how many days a week, and were there how did they did they have the opportunity to uh, have take holidays? Um, very good question. Initially, sixteen hour shifts, seven days a week. Um, but that they didn't tolerate that for very long. And eventually, um, the miners themselves, even pre-unionization, required a day off 
a week. Um, but it was a long time before 16 hours went down to 12. And then once with unions that you could get the, the work shift down to eight. But initially, the very first ones to come 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, are there um, are there still recruitment records for these coal companies? And are they, and also, how can we trace the employers uh, to, to look up these records or track them? Well, down? hopefully for your, this is a tough, this is a really good question because it's a really tough one. The answer is do those records still exist? I don't know. Um, the best way I think would be to find out what coal company your ancestor worked for, go to them and ask them if the, if those, their very first records still exist. Um, it's going to be tough, though. A lot of those companies don't exist anymore, for one thing. So that uh, where those records might be. And one of the things I would also say is if you um, a lot of coal towns today and coal areas have um, historical societies, who maybe they have it. If the coal mine's gone or whatever. Like I know, for instance, the Fayette County in Western Pennsylvania has a, um, a like a coal heritage center. And um, and they help do a lot of people. So if you're from like Uniontown, Connellsville, Masontown, New Salem, any of those coal patches down there, West Brownsville, Brownsville, um, they may have resources from those old coal towns from and that even the company doesn't exist anymore. But you're going to have to. The, I think the biggest thing that's going to be tough for people who are trying to trace that is you're going to have to do it if you know where your that where your ancestor came and settled was where he stayed. Um, because a lot of, you heard me talk about a lot of coal miners as their economics in coal towns went up and down, moved on from town to town to town. <coughs> I attend a, 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 um, a Rusin Orthodox Church in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, which is a steel town. But a lot of my people, as I got to know them, a lot of my people are former coal miners from, uh, from coal mine places. Um, you know, from um, Punxsutawney and um, some of the other, um, Sykesville, um, so it's re re New Alexandria. So they're all coal miners who, when coal miners, coal mines started to economically decline in the 40s and early 50s, but steel was growing, they moved on and settled there. So, um, but if you're one of those people who, you know, you settled in, in, um, German, your ancestors were recruited by a coal company in German, Pennsylvania, but then 10 years later, um, they moved to Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, and, you know, four years later, they moved to Pleasant City, Ohio, which is where they lived out the rest of their life. You got to know where they started. Once you know where they started, then you would be able to see it track and see if there are records in that community. Okay. Um, the next question we have is, um, were there, did women work in the mines at all? Uh, the answer to that is yes, on a very limited basis. Um, it was, it's really wasn't very common, but you heard me talk about, and sometimes in small spaces, they would use boys to go in there to get the coal. It was the same thing with women. Sometimes in small spaces that men couldn't fit, they would have women who would go in, crawl in those spaces and get the coal. Um, so they did, but in a very limited way. All right. Okay. Um, so uh, the next question we have is, uh, um, and this is kind of outside of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so someone asks, were there coal mines in Tennessee where immigrants settled in um, other parts of the country? Yeah. Uh, okay. I was going to say, I have to tell you that I don't know specifically about Tennessee, though I don't think that state had much immigrant settlement. The second part of the country, did they settle in other places? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, um, West Virginia, the West Virginia Panhandle um, and Southern West Virginia had large immigrant populations. There were some coal mining communities in Western Virginia, you know, the state of Virginia. Um, there were coal mining communities, some ethnic coal mining communities in Kentucky, um, a little bit down south. And then there were miners who were not coal miners necessarily, which surprises people. So there were a lot of ethnic communities in Colorado. 
um, in Denver, in Fort Collins, there were lots of mines there, some copper mines especially. Um, there were miners, ethnic community miners in um, Stockton, Montana, um, in Olympia, Washington. Um, so any place there were mines, in most instances, you will find these settlement groups. In Appalachia going south, you don't find it much. It's mostly people from, from the British Isles whose family came long before they were coal mines. Um, but remember that these people had very difficult economic times. And so when the coal mines opened, they had local population to go work there. They rarely had to bring anybody because they had a, a local population that would readily leave their poor agricultural settings and go work in the mine. Okay. Um, to, to follow up with that, uh, someone uh, mentioned that their family, uh, they came in through Galveston, Texas, and they were recruited to work in mines in New Mexico uh, between uh, 1906 to 1910. And so the towns that they were in were called Van Houten, Ta Dawson, Brilliant, and Sugar Wright. Um, can you, so the question is, would these towns, would, would they have been considered to be coal patch towns? I have to confess, I've never heard of any of those communities, so I don't I don't dispute it exists. I've just never heard anything about them, or even if they were, you know, in the southwest, there was a lot more metallic kinds of things like um like silver and copper and and that kind of lead that kind of stuff. But I don't know anything about New Mexico and the mines there. Okay, um, so I guess a, a follow up to the I guess. A, uh, someone asks, this is, are there many elements of the coal mine culture which were present in the steel mill culture as well? Um, yeah, there are some crossovers. Um, you heard me talk a little bit. The steel mills, the, the steel communities were really, um, and because remember, they were found a little bit later, just a little bit later than coal mining. Um, but so when you ended up with unionization, the steel towns really had this mindset of let's recruit multiple ethnic groups so they can't communicate to one another to unionize. And this was after 1892 with the Great Homestead Steel Strike. When that occurred, um, Andrew Carnegie's group made the decision that they were going to recruit from a very broad area so that um, so that they couldn't re and, and quite honestly, the, um, the, the what I talked about, the coals, patches using blacks from the south as scab laborers. This was really rare for the coal towns, but it was a standard practice in the steel mills, which is why even if you go today in any place in Pennsylvania, still yet the coal patches have very, very small, if very small African-American populations, if any, whereas the steel communities usually have large African-American populations. Um, so that the company script, all that company stuff, um, the, the steel mills, to my knowledge, didn't do any of that. And remember that steel towns are much, much larger than coal patches because you need so many more men to work a, to work a steel mill. So, you know, an average, like growing up here in Western Pennsylvania, when I was growing up and steel was still working, I mean, you know, the average steel town had anywhere from eight, eight to 25,000, 8,000 to 25,000 people. You know, something at Keysport, 36,000 people. So these are much larger places. So they did have downtowns with businesses, you know, and local business people and, um, and a broader perspective that then a stronger economic structure that could support more than a coal patch with 3,000 people or 2,000 people or 150 people. Okay. Um, so the next question I have, or it's come from the audience is, uh, what role did Slovaks and other Slops play in the formation of the uh, United Mine Workers of America and the industrial workers of the world? Um, I, I don't know how to answer that. Clearly, individuals of varying ethnic groups played uh, a role in United Mine Workers um, because that was a, a later development. And so those ethnic groups were already here. But I you have to confess, I can't really say much more than that. Um, they don't know exactly who played what role and ethnically who played what role in the unionization movement. Okay. Um, so the next question we have is uh, it's about the company houses. 
So mm -hmm. were uh, company houses more common in Western Pennsylvania or in Eastern Pennsylvania? I've seen them in both. So I'm assuming they're, they're standard practice in both. Okay. Um, so the next uh, few questions I have are, that have come from the audience uh, are regarding education. Uh, so one person asks, uh, could coal miners' children attend public schools in the area, or they or, or did they just attend schools in the uh, in the uh, coal patch? Uh, they did attend, like all American kids, they were required to attend school. Um, but there were two ways your kids could get an education in the coal patch, and that was they either did attend a regular public school, and most of the patches had their own their own school, as small as they were. But those immigrants who came, who came, who were Catholics, who had a substantial settlement in the community, almost always had a Roman Catholic school for those children. So a lot of coal patch kids were, so let's say you were in a coal patch with 800 people, but 400 of them were Slovaks. Well, then they would have their own Slovak Catholic church and would found their own Slovak Roman Catholic school. But public education was available to kids in all the coal patches. And sometimes what would happen was the patches were small enough that by the time your kids got to like junior, senior, high age, then there was a central high school. One of those towns had a high school that your kids would have to travel to. But that's exactly the same system that exists to this day in rural areas in Europe. Okay, um, the follow-up question about education. Uh, were there night schools to help the recent immigrants learn English? Um, there were, but they tended to be in larger communities. So, um, and that's because the first night schools weren't organized by the government or even by the coal companies. They were uh, they organized generally by wealthier individuals, and primarily women. Um, of, of the middle class and upper middle class who saw the challenges that, the social challenges that immigrants faced. And so they would do things like found um, night programs to teach education. They would found, I see this more in steel than in, again, because it was bigger, but they would found public baths. So these people had some place to bathe and they could teach them good hygiene. Because remember, nobody has any running water in a coal patch house. Um, so they, so there were programs to teach English to immigrants, but they were social programs that were coordinated by churches or individuals, not by the company or the government. Okay. Um, so the next uh, set of questions we have is concerning uh, script or script. Mm -hmm. So, um, so the first question is. Uh, let's see, how did coal miners who only earned script accumulate wealth to move out of the coal patches? Well, script didn't exist forever and ever. I mean, it eventually went out. But so the answer is in the early days when everybody was prey to script, how did they economically be able to move out of the coal patches? They couldn't. It, you couldn't. This was, they had you, you know, by, they had you. Um, but eventually, and the other thing you can do with script is, you know, you got somebody who maybe has a brother in a larger city. Um, who's getting paid in a steel mill with dollars, or, you know, then yeah, they trade some dollars for script. Or, you know, there's a trade system going on, too, where you could eventually trade, um, like in prison, cigarettes for dollars, you know. Um, you could eventually um, uh, trade script for dollars to be able to use in other places. And I don't know this. I have had some people tell me that there was there was sometimes that you could go to the local store and if it was something that they didn't carry that you told them you wanted you could exchange script for dollars to be able to go and buy that in a larger community okay uh so the next question about script is uh, uh let's see how do you determine the wages of miners if paid in script script um well, script is like, I mean, it's like their own monetary system. Script is like dollars, so, except it's script. So, you know, so it comes payday. And um, and I worked um, 60 hours this week at um, 50 cents per hour, you know. So I got $30 worth of script, like Monopoly money, you know. Um, 
in terms of I guess um, I guess of the amounts that they were paid, do you uh, can you say uh, where or which mines paid the most and 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 why? Was it was there a difference between the hard and soft or hard and uh, soft? To my knowledge. Yeah, I don't. I really can't answer that. Uh, do I know if there was if you were paid higher in one in bituminous according to anthracite? I don't know that. I suspect not. Okay. All right. I'm gonna scan through the questions here. There's been quite a uh, since I started uh, reading through these. There's there's been numerous editions, so. Uh, so we do have a uh, we do have a, a, a John. We do have a we do have a Rusin uh, trivia question. Okay. Is uh is Richard? It better, it better not start with my grandmother came from no. Orlov in nineteen. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's uh, no, it's uh, is uh. Is Richard Trumka, uh, current head of the AFL, is he is he Rusin? Do you know? To my knowledge, to my knowledge, he's Polish. Okay. Okay. Um... All right. It's actually this is another this is another wage uh, question. Uh, do you know what the average pay for northeastern Pennsylvania Pennsylvania miners was in the 1920s? Um, I don't. But that's a great question for any of those historical societies. So I would get my hands on any historical society in northeastern PA and ask that question. All right. Uh, okay. Another. This is another. Uh, this, this is a. Uh, on a different. This question is on a different topic. Uh, can you? Or the question is: Can you comment on the difference between the Russian Brotherhood and the Greek Catholic Union from the per, from the perspective of cho of choosing a fraternal organization? Um. They, well, I can talk about those two organizations. I um. I know both of them pretty well. Um. The Russian Brotherhood. Um, what broke off from the Greek Catholic Union, I can't remember, maybe sometime in the early 20s, late teens, um, when the Greek Catholics were um, having trouble with the Roman Catholic bishops, they began a movement where they said, um, we're going to go, we're going to join the Orthodox Church, um, because that's the church out of which we came in 1646. Um, and at that time, um, when the Greek Catholics who wanted to leave and control their own parishes went to join Orthodoxy, there was only one Orthodox jurisdiction in the United States. There wasn't a Russian Orthodox Church and a Greek Orthodox Church and a Serbian Orthodox Church. The only Orthodox jurisdiction in the U.S. was the Russian Church, and it at that and, and, and it only had four parishes, um, three on the. California, uh, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and New York City. Um, so when these Rusins started to join the Russian Orthodox Church, they were coming in massive numbers. I mean, by the by the early 20s, almost 50,000 Rusin Greek Catholics had joined the Orthodox Church. Um, but they joined the Russian Church. And um, at that time in Europe, the um, Russian government and the Austrian government were having a battle over Russia wanted to expand into Europe and the only way to do that would be to invade Austria Hungary so um, Russia was in Europe trying to convince Rusins in Austria Hungary that they were actually Russians from the Carpathians um, to counteract that the Austrians backed a new movement coming out of Yuvil um, which was also in Galicia called Ukrainians and so the Austrians backed this group to say to Rusins in Galicia, you're not Russians and Orthodox, you're Ukrainians and Catholic. Um, and this separation exists to this day in multiple communities in the United States. But so the same thing, when they got here, that, that same battle came along. 
So when Greek Catholics were leaving the Ruthenian, Latin for Rus and Greek Catholic Church, they were only joining the Russian Orthodox Church, and, at, and the Russian government just thought this was like a, a windfall, a gift to them, because now they could put these Rusins in the Russian Church, convince them that they're Russians, and remember what I said about immigration, we weren't staying here, everybody was going back. So they could go back to Austria-Hungary, believing that they are Russians, convince their brothers and sisters of that. So the Russian Orthodox mission poured a ton of money into helping Rusins start Orthodox parishes in the United States. And, um, and so once they were Orthodox, um, they weren't exactly welcome to be members of the Greek Catholic Union. Um, and so they started their own fraternals. And one of the earliest was RBO, the Russian Brotherhood Organization which was made up of <coughs> both Russians and Rusins, but 80, 90% of the membership was Carpathia Rusin. Okay, the uh, next question we have is, uh, is about uh, uh, language ability. So uh, someone um, asks, uh, for example, if, uh, if a, if a if a if a Slovak or Pole could speak English when they immigrated, um, would they have been paid a, at a higher rate than say those who didn't have that English skill? I think anybody who had English skill got a little bit more money. But when I want to meet the Slovak who, coal miner who immigrated knowing English, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good good question there. Um, but I bet, but here, I mean, once again, there are kids did really well. Let's go to the second generation. Your kids did really well in school. Your kids learned English really quick. They would have a better economic opportunity in the coal mine than you would. Okay. Um, so uh, the next question we have is, uh, uh, someone wants to know about the, uh, the conscription rules in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Uh, you mentioned it at the start of your presentation. Sure, it was um, at the turn of the century. It was, um, I believe, it was eight years conscription and active conscription. That doesn't necessarily mean you were in the army the whole eight years, but you were what was called active duty. And then after that, twelve years of reserve. So you were committed for twenty years. So eight years, they, they, you were pretty much in an active status. But after that, you were not allowed to leave your, not allowed to move from your village. Your residents had to stay the same for the next 12 years while you were in reserves. Uh, the next question I have from the audience is, how did the coal miners and families amuse themselves, assuming they had the opportunity to do so? <laughs> That's a really good question. You heard me talk about the isolation of these coal patches. They, what they really did was kind of recreate their village in Europe. So, you know, on a Saturday night, if you went to a coal patch, you know, at some point there was a Polish National Alliance club with a bar and a dance hall and a theater stage. And, you would go there and dance Polish dances and listen to Polish music on Saturday nights. And occasionally there would be a play produced in the Polish language. Um, and, uh, and so this is what they did. I mean, they entertained themselves just like they did in the old country. And everybody, ethnic group could do that, you know, within the, the isolation of their own selves. And the other thing too is they, <coughs> excuse me, often, especially if it was too small for them to have a separate club, often the church became the center of cultural life. So uh, if you go a lot to a lot of these ethnic churches, you go in the basement and they're big enough to accommodate several hundreds of people. And there's a stage with a curtain, you know, and there's a kitchen. And so, you know, you could cook food and, and you could have entertainment. And um, quite often these plays in the Rusin community, these plays were called Pritzelinia and they were actually used as ways to help fund the church, like the proceeds you paid, you know, 15 cents for your ticket to go in and you bought your food and all the proceeds from that performance went to help fund the church. Okay, the next question we have is, uh, did bad weather ever shut down the mines? Um, not to my knowledge, because, you know, once you're in a mine, there's no bad weather. 
<laughs> and everybody walks. So um, I've not ever heard of anything like that. Uh, someone asks about the about the immigration laws of the 20s. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you comment on what I guess what motivated the those immigration laws in the 20s? Well, it was the concept that America it, it was at the federal level, um, not unlike what we ex we're experiencing to some degree today. It was the fact that immigration was so heavy that white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Americans were terrified that they were no longer going to be the ruling class in America, that they were somehow going to become a minority in their own country. And so that's what motivated it, um, was that they just did that. Um, and you have to understand at that time, how many um, ethnic individuals, um, let alone Catholics, did you have in the US Senate and the US Congress? Very, very few. Um, so it was it was motivated by this xenophobia, this fear that what we have, what is ours, that what we run, they're going to take over. Okay. So let me uh, scroll through the questions here. I think we've covered most of them. Uh, Okay. Uh, well, John, I think we've 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 uh, we've gone through all the questions here. So, I would like to thank you for a very informative presentation today. I learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience learned a lot too. And I'd like to let every, everyone know that a recording of this presentation will be made available soon on the Slovak American Society's uh, YouTube channel, and which we would encourage you to share with your family and friends. So. We will be sending out a notice uh, via email when that is available for your viewing. And if you would like to learn more about the Slovak American Society, uh, please visit us at dcslovaks.org. So I would like to thank John for his wonderful presentation today, and I would like to thank you all for joining us today. So, um, so enjoy your weekend, and uh, happy Halloween. <laughs>